increase mainly because of the expansion of the sea water by uh, increasing temperature and melting down of the uh, glaciers from Arctic and Antarctic area and other areas. Um, so well, 20 centimeters doesn't look very bad, but uh, there is an exponential increase uh, predicted and by end of this century, it could be around one meter higher. So those who have a beautiful uh, uh, luxurious house by the beautiful beach may lose their land uh, by the end of the 21st century. Uh, and by uh, uh, 2300, it could be uh, three meter higher, uh, depending on the uh, carbon dioxide level. Please remember that this kind of prediction is not just wild gas or hypothesis. Uh, these are uh, conclusion of the thousands of meteorologists and geoscientists uh, around the world and uh, 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 consolidated by the UN mechanism. So uh, that's why I call it, this is an uh, uh, unequivocal effect, or uh, uh, this is what they concluded. Then uh, from his point of view, what does it mean? We know very well that uh, climate has been known to affect human health since Hippocrates period. Hippocrates lived uh, uh, 200-300 BC and he wrote a book about uh, how airs, waters and places uh, uh, affect human health already at the time. So it is not new that uh, these climate changes will have some consequence on health. Most well known consequence is the uh, uh, vector borne diseases distribution and transmission. These vector borne diseases such as malaria, dengue fever, or chikungunya, some other tropical diseases uh, uh, transmit much faster in the warm and humid environment because of the density of a mosquito and the faster reproduction of virus in the body of a mosquito. So uh, uh, that's uh, one already observed impact. Another uh, impact, other impacts are uh, foodborne disease and waterborne disease and other emerging diseases. You may know that uh, even in the uh, uh, developed countries, we are seeing a dengue fever, sometimes malaria, other tick-borne diseases uh, coming up because uh, the weather became warmer. Um, can you see this slide from your side? Yeah, health is, is okay? sensitive to climate. This is okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Also, <clears throat> another well-established association between weather and mortality is uh, is cardiovascular impact. Um, al already uh, in 2003, in Europe, they had a terrible experience. Um, there was uh, almost two months of heat wave in June, Ju uh, July and August. And uh, during that period, uh, European countries recorded additional 20, uh, sorry, 70,000 extra deaths as compared to the previous average. Most casualties were uh, elderly people living alone. Interestingly, uh, sick elderly in the hospital survived because they were taken care of by the professionals and in the uh, air-conditioned environment. Those healthy elderly living alone, even uh, without relying on their family members, they were the first victims. Very interesting, uh, sad uh, uh, tragedy. 70,000 extra deaths. So uh, that's uh, kind of extreme. But uh, even though uh, the heat wave, wave may, may not be that bad, uh, there can be uh, consequences on cardiovascular, respiratory disease, and other non-communicable diseases. Uh, do you see burden of climate sensitive disease now? Okay. Uh, so WHO calculated the burden of climate sensitive diseases uh, early 2000 and uh, recently again. Uh, in conclusion, uh, every year, uh, between 150,000 uh, deaths are occurring every year. Uh, basically, WHO used the existing number of deaths uh, already estimated and uh, calculated the proportion that will be influenced by climate change. That's how they calculated. And this diagram uh, summarizes uh, the uh, relationship between climate change and health. 
uh, basically uh, uh, through different test ways, climate change increase the incidence of foodborne disease, waterborne disease, and vector-borne diseases. Also, it uh, influences the the main uh, the functioning of the hospitals because hospitals are damaged by cyclones uh, and flood floodings, uh, things like that. So uh, that's why in 2009, uh, when they were publishing uh, 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 an article, uh, a very comprehensive uh, assessment of health impact, uh, Lancet editor uh, summarized, climate change is the biggest uh, global health threat in the 21st century. And uh, do you see the Pacific Island map now? Yes, you can see. Okay, so uh, I continue. Um, my office covers uh, 14 independent Pacific Island countries that I show I have shown in the map. Also, there are eight um, not independent uh, territories that they, that belong to. Uh, uh, New Zealand or America or France, like French Polynesia, uh, uh, New Caledonia. Uh, so altogether, we have uh, 22 political entities uh, uh, that our office is covering. So my talk will be uh, uh, focusing on the uh, Pacific countries. Uh, this picture shows the highest uh, peak of uh, Kiribati. Uh, mainland where uh, the capital is located. The highest point is 3 meter. So definitely if uh, there's no change of uh, greenhouse gas emission in the next century, uh, th most of this island will be underwater. And the uh, next uh, one, uh, this is a uh, hospital school for uh, children in the pediatrics uh, world of uh, National Referral Hospital, the largest hospital uh, in the Solomon Island. You can see uh, the eroded uh, land uh, by the sea, and uh, that eroded land is used uh, as a dump site now. Uh, and uh, this is the overview, uh, air view, actual aerial view of that hospital. The red line was the seashore line uh, during the World War Two, when the a hospital was built by uh, U.S. Army, U.S. Navy. There was a heavy, uh, heavy battle between uh, Japanese and uh, American uh, uh, Navy at the time, and uh, American Navy built hospitals. So that's why how we can compare the sea level at the time in red line and the current current sea level uh, in black line. So clearly, uh, sea uh, level is increasing, or uh, uh, the Sea water is uh, approaching to the hospital uh, boundary. So uh, currently, WHO is working on three uh, projects: uh, vulnerability assessment and adaptation capacity. Basically, we helped uh, 11 countries in their in their assessment of vulnerability and development of uh, adaptation capacity. Second one is uh, piloting climate change adaptation to to protect human health in Fiji, uh, with other uh, seven countries. And the uh, last one is new one, uh, building resilience of health systems to climate change in four least developed countries, Kiribati, Solomon Island, Tuvalu, and Vanuatu. Uh, so uh, what do we mean uh, by vulnerability and adaptation assessment method? Uh, this is the first process of uh, starting uh, risk assessment and management. Uh, in terms of uh, health impact of climate change. So first, we identify human health risks for current climate variability and recent climate changes. And then uh, we uh, estimate, uh, predict the future health risks uh, using the meteorological predictions. And then we uh, prioritize the policies and programs to address current and projected health risks. And then establish a process for monitoring and managing the health risks of climate change. And then uh, the topic of this presentation, why evidence-based public health approach important? Um, 
First, uh, we have uh, consolidated evidence on global climate change. So from meteorological side, uh, evidence is more than sufficient. It's now a fact. We don't need any more evidence any, uh, to prove the fact. However, while we are seeing a lot of increasing outbreaks of climate-related health outcomes, uh, we don't have uh, sufficient evidence for many reasons. Uh, this is a new area. Uh, and uh, also the, uh, the outcome uh, is very slow and non-specific, so very difficult to uh, measure and uh, associate with the climate factors. In this situation, uh, countries are uh, pressed to start adaptation. So climate change adaptation should start with very little evidence. So uh, 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 evidence-based public health approach became very important in this environment, in this situation. Uh, what is evidence-based public health? You know well what evidence-based medicine is at the individual patient care level. Yeah, similar approach to the uh, population health. Uh, that is uh, evidence-based public health. However, unlike evidence-based medicine, evidence-based public health emphasize less on evidence hierarchy, but more emphasis on the knowledge translation from uh, scientific research to the uh, policy actions. Um, the process uh, and Dr. framework Kim, of... Dr. Yes? Dr. Yep. Could you summarize, would you summarize, please? Okay, okay yes, I, I'll hurry up. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, framework is uh, basically a uh, um, first, the uh, problem is assessed, and then evidence is collected, uh, and then uh, the recommendation is uh, derived, and then prioritized. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, conventional evidence-based public health uh, uh, approach uh, can be uh, adapted to climate change adaptation work. And uh, there was a recent uh, publication by Hess et al. Uh, in the environmental health perspective, so I don't want to go through. But uh, this, uh, this paper summarized very well. And uh, uh, from our work, there was some evidence produced uh, in Fiji, like uh, uh, the uh, uh, proportion of uh, variation that can be explained by uh, climate variables. From our analysis in Fiji, uh, dengue fever, 50% of dengue fever can be explained by climate change. Oh, what happened? Uh, maybe hello. Okay, thank you again. Hello. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I understand. I have to finish quickly. <laughs> okay. Okay, sorry. Please go ahead. Yeah, almost there. I think uh, I need uh, two more minutes. Is it okay? Yeah, we are far behind the schedule. Please go ahead. All right, okay. Okay, so these are the results. Uh, like uh, this graph, U, U uh, shape graph shows the higher diarrhea in the drought period and flood period. This is evidence. Also, uh, the, uh, dengue fever and, and diarrheal diseases are higher uh, during the drought and flood and uh, cyclones. So, and, uh, so uh, we uh, communicated with the experts in the country to identify uh, climate-sensitive uh, health risks uh, in the vulnerability assessment. And uh, now, most countries have a national action plan on climate change and health. And, uh, uh, we apply the evidence-based public health approach to health adaptation in the Pacific Island countries, and that's how we uh, included uh, health information and climate early warning systems in the project component. So let me conclude. Uh, um, we, uh, it is very important to adopt uh, evidence-based public health approach to climate change adaptation in health sector as much as the evidence is very uh, little at the moment. So we have to uh, use the evidence available uh, efficiently as possible. 
uh, we need to build comprehensive surveillance and information system in the country to collect more evidence. And uh, uh, we have to use climate-based early warning system. Uh, basically, the idea is to use climate data to predict uh, health outcomes and quantify impacts of climate change on health and uh, health score benefits of mitigation adaptation. And uh, our uh, goal is to build climate resilient health system through uh, a strong governance and policies and also building safe and green hospitals. Uh, also, uh, in relation to Dr. Yoon's presentation, uh, e-health in the developing countries are very, very important, especially in the Pacific Island countries. Uh, so many uh, 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 remote islands uh, are not really connected to any uh, uh, medical services uh, so at the moment. So uh, e, uh, EMR or even uh, uh, e-health and telemedicine approach will be an important part of the climate change adaptation in the Pacific. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for taking too long time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim. So is there any questions, uh, Flo and uh, remote speakers? Uh, I have a very quick question. Uh, referring to governance and the policies, are there any discrepancy between conceptual priority on uh, climate change and the sustainable environment in terms of a budget allocation? Most uh, countries uh, think conceptually they, this is a very top priority, but actually budget in terms of budget allocations, they are low priority on to do. So what your opinion on please very short answer give us thank you yes uh, that, that is the actually a key issue for the moment globally uh, there is a huge amount of uh, support for climate change adaptation and also many governments developing countries identify health adaptation as a priority so uh, so uh, naturally there should be you know, That that's from the fizzy. Yeah. The other side on login. Uh, from the Fiji side. Okay. Anyway, we need to reconnect from him. Okay, okay. So uh, I think that we uh, we will go go continue. Okay, so next speaker from uh, Dr. Javid. I, uh, Dr. Javed, I know you are connecting from Saudi Arabia. So you live in Fiji, don't you? Are you visiting Saudi Arabia now? No, I'm visiting Saudi Arabia as an executive consultant under the program of government of Pakistan. Oh, okay. So uh, with speakers from the cold Boston and the uh, hot Saudi Arabia simultaneously, I am feeling very strange. So in future cyber lab life, so I think we might have much strange situation already than now. Okay, Dr. Javed uh, Amnan completed his MBBS at Alama Lakbal Medical College, Lahore, in 1998. Then, after internship, he started his surgical residence at Jinnah Hospital, Lahore, and was certified as a surgeon by College of Physicians and Surgeons, Pakistan, in April. Okay, receiving invitation from Fiji National University, now he accepted it as an opportunity to start endovascular surgery in South Pacific region as well as academic activity as associate professor surgery for graduate and postgraduate teaching. Dr. Javed, please go ahead. Are you able to see me? Okay, please go ahead. I am going to present this uh, basic endovascular surgery. Why I choose this topic for the today's discussion, it's very important because I got the training in this uh, special type of surgery from Arizona Heart Institute, USA. And uh, you know, in other parts of the world, this specialty is non existence usually. Very, uh, very few level, the major tertiary care hospitals outside the US. So we can connect with our mentors to the e-health and discuss the cases with our parent institutes, especially the difficult cases, and this e-health can be helpful in this specific branch of medicine. So that's why I choose this topic of basic endovascular surgery for today's discussion. 
i understand everyone not maybe understand to much details of endovascular surgery so if you are not able to you may say look comfortable with few slides it's okay but i will keep it generalized basically it's a special branch of surgery which uses uses needles wires catheters and sheets as a basic stuff but there are, there are different types of interventions we use balloon stents stent grafts filters thrombolytics cochlear devices i was mean intravascular ultrasound most of the people they are well aware of this uh, cardiac angiography angioplasty but this branch involves all of extra cardiac vessels in this branch cardiac comes under the interventional cardiologist and endovascular surgeon deal all vessels except the cardiac so various type of instruments as shown in this picture endoluminal therapy we go inside the vessels offer offers less invasive approaches thereby justifying intervention at earlier stages in the symptoms and disease complex this is different than our approach to the medicine in the highly populated areas of the world like asia india pakistan the area patient comes with a symptoms and we diagnose and treat but this is a different branch we try to identify the disease and intervene at earlier stage similarly when it started in around in 1990s two decades ago it was not much sophisticated and uh, special uh, you may say it developments in last two decades they have changed the face of this branch so lot of crude techniques they have now become much sophisticated the passage of time and in this picture you can see one balloon from left hand side then a stent which is not covered then a covered stent and then different type of other instruments these are the things which we are using over the passage of time as soon as things are developed new and new techniques are coming and uh, i wish to emphasize these techniques they are not developed by the medical doctors always medical doctors we, as a medical doctor a surgeon we just treat the patient and collect the data and present at various conferences these are helped by our engineering colleagues who understand the characteristics of different metals and also many other people who are just working as a supportive of the medical fund of course this is 21st century and we should go for new and new things we cannot go with the traditional medicines of 200 years or 2000 years so we have to change we are the people on move modern treatment methods must accommodate our lifestyle but this notion is much correct in north america and western europe in the rest of the rest part of the world which is highly populated like india pakistan bangladesh china these areas still people are quite away from their basic health needs so the one of the disease which commonly is treated by this technology is intermittent claudication to simplify it what is this disease absence of pain at rest patient start walking and then there is a tension of weakness after walking has begun intensification of condition until walking becomes impossible and uh, disappearance of the symptoms after a period of rest so this is basically the leg pain in a common sense on walking which is relieved by the rest this is the most of the common disease and then we do the angiography angiography you can understand we put some dye in the vessel and take a traditional x ray and then these x rays are more modified in a special machine called fluoroscopy and then we can use a advanced techniques as well so laser light amplification by stimulated emission of rays it was a much more you may say exciting stuff which came and we started using lasers and opening the vessels which were being closed by the fat plaques with the passage of time interventional treatment should be reserved for the most symptomatic patients yes this is a notion of 1998 now it's to 2015 things may have changed laser therapy created excitement yes laser was very easy to burn those plaques then they started heating those plaques fat collections inside the vessel but this is a not much exciting and so it failed then there was the idea that we should remove those plaques and we started to use various instruments and they were as good as the biopsy instruments 
initially we started to take those uh, plots but it plays the vessel wall as a naked and again and again it started to produce more atheromas and it started to create the trouble for the new atheroma formation this is a single most breakthrough that is putting a stent from the inside the vessel we go inside the vessel we dilate the channel and then put a stent a metallic material so the vessel should remain open initially it was used by the iliac vessels mean the vessels which are taking the blood to the lower legs lower limbs a second most common breakthrough is the shared stent for coronaries coronaries everyone is available uh, well aware everywhere in the world the people they get this uh, myocardial infarction heart attacks and then they go for this uh, coronary stent overnight endoluminal approaches became the standard of practice in many arterial distribution because open surgery was always a complication and when the patient find it is very exciting thing and and done very limited anesthesia better outcome so overnight where people can afford it became you may say standard of practice where we can use it outside the heart i'm stressing again and again heart remains with the cardiologist especially the international cardiologist rest of the vessels like here the vessel which is flying the blood to the upper arm subclavian vessel then to the kidney renal vessel ileus to the lower legs aorta the main vessel of the body sfa in the anterior thigh below knee vessels occipital vessels all these things we can use in those vessels to open the channels but always these things are associated with some troubles what was the trouble because there is some foreign body made up of metal inside the vessel so the major issue was restenosis and then instant restenosis so we have to again and again intervene for this reason people started thinking is they started to understand the characteristics of the different metals to change the metal characteristics and then to load them with the materials or drugs which can prevent this restenosis like heparin certain antibiotics they used the researchers are seeking the solution they started using a cutting balloon that we should open and cut atheroma that was you being used a cutting balloon then there is a drug called heparin so it is for the prevention of this uh, atheroma formation it was being used but clinically it did not show any much benefit so they came towards the naturally occurring antibiotics actinomycin d but this trial was halted due to certain reasons then they came towards this sirolimus it is various names of antibiotics and they were using these things to load these uh, stents but basically as a medical doctor the technical details of these things they are beyond our scope and it is done by the engineers and we are the people who just use them but still we are getting this balanced effect inhibition of restenosis and healing of stented vessel this should be balanced so that we can get the clinical benefits investigations are extending into the peripheral circulation wherever we start the central vessel surgery as a new thing we go with the peripheral vessel surgery rather than just starting at the carotid the abdominal aorta and major vessel so we start with the surgery to the legs and there we can see we can put the stent we can put the graft and then multiple technology can be applied in a single patient given this is a very good system silver hawk system it was developed to basically remove the atheroma and it removed the very very big atheroma you can see in the picture atheroma is mean that collection of this fat inside the vessel to simplify the stuff then the cryoplasty cool laser different types of techniques they were used but this was limited to the small vessel especially in peripheral vascular side there is one more important thing like the aneurysms aneurysms of the great vessel like thoracic aorta the big thoracic aortic vessel and the abdominal aorta this was our traditional side we were working like you may say putting the new grafts inside the body major surgery then mostly the outcome was not uh, good patient has to remain for the long time in icu and 
this was our traditional approach but with the passage of time various companies like medtronic andologix go spoke all help in developing these different types of stents so now we don't have to make such a big incisions and open it up we have to just go with the inside the vessel and put the stent and they exclude those dilated portions of the canary so this is the traditional incision that you, you can see in this picture it was a very big incision in the old times when we used to open it up sometime we have to do if we are failed in this endologic technique then we can use this one and then there are some difficult anatomies where we can't put the stents then we go with the open technique so with the as a coming to my uh, conclusion of this uh, presentation i can suggest that with the use of this e health technique we can extend these technologies and all these discussion to uh, areas where experts are not available especially outside the united states and western europe if we wish to discuss these cases there are the countries wish to use the technologies wish to communicate with the companies who are producing these different types of uh, mesh stents and other interventions we can uh, go ahead with the use of this technology and help in the better outcome of our patient thank you very much for your patience thank you any question you. okay thank you javed Uh, are there any questions from here or from speakers? Okay, so uh, thank you, Javed, for your uh, participation. Uh, even though very big time difference, so uh, due to the time <laughs> limitations, we will move the next speaker. Thank you yes, again, yes, sure. Dr. Javed. Uh, now is time for Dr. Hyung Chul La from South Korea. He is in charge of running PSM Graduate School with me in Korea. A PSM is a program training of uh, uh, professional manpower needed for industrialization of research results. Lectures and trainings are mostly ex executed in cyber lab. So, Dr. Na, please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Hyung Chul Ra at the PSM program in Chungbuk National University in Korea. So, I'd like to thank uh, the Health Education Organizer for. Uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, to at the uh, APEN conference. So today, um, I will talk about the situations of biomedical researchers in Korea, South Korea using a science survey conducted in, in year 2013. Then I will discuss our PSM education profile focused on the biomedical field. Uh, the purpose of the survey that I'm presenting was to pull the conditions of employment in the biomedical R&D field as a reference for policy making. The survey targets were biomedical R&D employees in Korea. So 60, 677 people participated in the survey. The survey was conducted through online. And the two agencies carried out the survey, including BRIC, uh, one of the, um, uh, the BRIC, um, um, uh, one of the big um, portal uh, site in the, bi in the biomedical field, and the Hungarian Science On, which is a part of the daily newspaper in Korea. So for the survey result, out of um, uh, 677 uh, votes, 81% were in research and development. And for the employment condition, more than half of the um, participants have temporary or contract positions. So among the temporary employees, more than 75% responded that they felt discrimination in terms of salary and benefits. Uh, in terms of job securities, um, so around 60% of the participants felt insecure. I'd like to remind you that uh, this number is close to the percentage of the temporary, uh, temporary employees in the previous slide. And in uh, here we have 64% uh, percent of the voters are dissatisfied with their benefits, which is also close to the portion of the temporary employees and who felt unsecure. Uh, here, um, around 73% of the participants are paid less than uh, 37,000 US dollars for their uh, in terms of annual salary, considering the education and experience, which will be discussed later. They are very um, underpaid. 
And 65 percent of the participants respond that they are dissatisfied with their salary, which makes sense. And in parallel with their um, um, dissatisfaction in salary, 78 percent respond that they consider applying for different jobs. Among those um, who consider applying for different jobs, uh, more than two thirds responded that their, their reasons for better uh, the reasons are there for better employment conditions and for job security, which may represent the issues of the um, temporary work conditions. Uh, uh, Three percent of the participants in the academia, including excuse me, university and university hospital and research institute, um, whereas to only 24 percent are in industry, consider, considering the underpaid salary. This pattern needs to be changed. And participant job titles vary from research assistant and postdoc and research professors. And here we have around 93% of the participants have graduate degrees. So if you record 73% of the participants are paid less than 40K in, uh, in previous slide. It's a very discouraging field. So participant work experience varies from uh, less than two years to um, longer than 20 years. Considering 61% of the participants have a whole PhD degree and at least um, three to five years of postdoc experience is expected in biomedical field, I'm roughly guessing that around 66% of the participants with uh, zero to seven years of experience are the ones with PhD um, holders. And uh, among the um, participants, uh, around 60% are in the uh, 30s, in which financial stability is very important to support their family. So this survey, uh, so combining together, this survey may suggest that around 60% of the participants may have many of the following in common. So PhD holders and in their 30s and temporary employees with less than $37,000 for annual salary. So there needs to be career paths for those who with higher education and experience. So please keep this in mind for next part. So our PSM program, which is stands for Professional Science Masters, is, trained to, is to train experts who can apply their knowledge in uh, basic science in business management strategies. So since our program is in the medical school, we are focusing on the biomedical and health-related science field among the basic science. So pharmaceuticals, medical device, bioinformatics, and disease prevention management are the fields that we are focusing on. So Chungbuk National University is located around 30 minutes of driving from the Osong Bio Valley and the Ochang Scientific Complex, which um, where more than 60, 60 biomedical and biotech companies, as well as government agencies and research centers are located. And Korea NIH, Korea NIH is one of them. So for, for that, um, to train, our, our object is to train the biomedical R&D uh, management experts for, to do that. Uh, so we, uh, teach the, um, manage, um, the knowledge of management and science knowledge with uh, informatics knowledge. So we also um, are developing the programs uh, for the evidence-based uh, information for the research, uh, biomedical research. So for our um, program, the, we are funded by government and so we, um, so we are very grateful. So um, for this original initial plan for six years of um, Supporting area uh, period, we are in the first phase. Um, first phase. So, and for the, uh, the um, for this uh, presentation, we are very thankful for for using this uh, survey result of the Scion and um, to use their um, 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 their bio um, bio um, the, um, the Scion survey, which permitted us to use their um, survey result. And. If there's any question, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Na. Are there any questions? Okay, uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Na. And I will move next speaker.
the last two uh, speakers uh, from Dr. Chan Yaholong from China and Dr. Chen Jiafeng from Taiwan, uh, respectively. Uh, two speakers will talk on evidence-based medicine of increasing importance recently. Uh, taking this opportunity of EBM talks at, at our session, I would like to make a network of EBM specialists and uh, hold regular online talks. Uh, we can see uh, the, uh, Dr. An from South Korea, Korea University, so he actually organized this EBM talks. Thank you again to Dr. An. And uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Chan Yaharong is a methodologist in key laboratory of evidence-based medicine and the knowledge translation of Gansu province and the evidence-based medicine center of Ranzhou University. Uh, Dr. Chan, please go ahead. Okay, <clears throat> good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Yolong Chan Khan. I come from Nanjo University. I'm very happy to join the station and honored to be here to give the presentation. Uh, I also, I'd like to thank our host, uh, the chair, uh, Dr. Han, and special thanks to Hee Sun Yang for her hard work and help. Mm. Uh, this is my hometown, Gansu province, which is shaped like a big deeper. The capital is Lanzhou city, located in the southeast part of the province. Uh, Gansu is one of the most important areas of uh, ancient China Silk Road. It's famous also for Mughal grottoes and paintings. Uh, this is my statement of disclosure. I have no commercial and academic conflicts of interest. Uh, today, I'd like to share with you evidence-based medicine breed system and practice guidelines in China. I will also introduce you our ongoing work and seek collaborations with you in the future. This is an editorial published in the last described when, why, and how evidence-based medicine was introduced in China. The author is uh, Professor Jiao Wang, who comes from Fudan University. She is the first person who translated the term evidence-based medicine into Chinese 20 years ago. And uh, generally, the development of evidence-based medicine in China can be divided into three stages. The preparation stage started in 1980s when China Clinical Epidemiology Network was established. And stage two came when Chinese Cochrane Center was funded in 1999, and the third stage began around 2004, when evidence-based medicine centers were widely established all over the country. So this map shows the distribution of EBM centers in China. Up to now, more than 20 centers established by medical universities and hospitals, and more than 80% medical universities and schools offer EBM courses. And about uh, 20 evidence-based medicine textbooks have been published in Chinese. Uh, in China, when we talk about EBM and when we do EBM research and teach EBM courses, actually, we mainly refer to three aspects. The first one is systematic reviews. This slide showed the systematic reviews and the meta-analysis published by Chinese authors in Medline over the last two decades. The, the number increased very fast. And China also became top 10 contribution country for Cochrane Library. Uh, the second aspect is evidence rating system. In the past 20 years, about 100 rating systems were developed by organizations such as NICE, SIEN, and Oxford. As the latest uh, development of evidence-based medicine, the grid system came around 2000, 
and it aims to provide a more comprehensive and transparent rating system for systematic reviewers and guideline developers. Uh, this is the official website of GRID, and more than 90 uh, national and international organizations have endorsed GRID system. There is a randomized trial found that GRID was also the best one uh, system compared with the other worldwide used rating system, such as NICE, Science, and Oxford. This slide showed Chinese Grid Center was established in 2011, and it was the second earlier grid center in the world. The key job of Chinese Grid Center include translate grid papers and software into Chinese provide grid training and workshops, help Chinese guideline developers and systematic reviewers use grid. This map showed the collaboration organizations and institutions of Chinese grid centers in China, such as China Ministry of Health, China CDC, China Cochrane Center, and the other medical universities and hospitals. Actually, it is gradually forming a national grid network. The third important aspect of evidence-based medicine might be practice guideline. In 2011, Institution of Medicine renewed the definition of clinical practice guideline, which highlighted two points. A clinical practice guideline should be based on systematic reviews and must balance the benefits and harms. So let's come back to the slide and uh, we can find that systematic reviews and grid are foundation of evidence-based practice guidelines. This is the logo of Guideline International Network, which is the largest organization about guideline development and implementation in the world. So next, I'd like to talk about guideline in China. This is the English paper published in the Chinese Medical Journal that we did. From 1993 to 2013, more than 400 uh, practice guidelines have been de developed in China, and about 40 to 50 guidelines were produced each year in recent five years. While in terms of uh, the quality of this guideline, when we use a grid tool to evaluate them, and all six domains far lower than, interna than international levels. The yellow bar showed the international levels. <clears throat> so we asked the Chinese guideline developers to list the top three factors that affect the quality of practice guideline. Uh, number one is poor quality of primary study. I will talk it later. Number two is lack of guidance and methods about how to develop uh, higher quality evidence-based guidelines. The number three is lack of funds. So this study conducted by Chinese Cochrane Center showed that more than 90% RCTs made in China were not true or real RCTs. We also identified three key challenges in this editorial. Can China master the guideline challenges? Include China uh, lacks capacity for evidence-based guideline development and coordination by a central agency. Just like uh, uh, NICE for UK and MICE uh, for Japan. Signal is there is no specific organization structure that supports clinical trials, systematic reviews, and guideline development. The last one is development and implementation of traditional Chinese medicine guidelines is a unique challenge. Actually, this is a very big topic, so I will not talk more about this in today's presentation. Actually, it's a long way to go to address all of those challenges, but we can take actions from now on. China has launched two key projects to promote the quality of Chinese guidelines. The first one is about the Chinese 
uh, about the guideline registration. As we all know, in 2008, WHO established the International Clinical Trial Registry Platform, and it is considered not only a landmark for clinical practice, uh, for clinical trials, but for evidence-based medicine. After three years, in 2011, uh, University of York launched a program about international prospective register of systematic reviews. Last year, Chinese Great Center and other Chinese universities and hospitals created a prospective guideline registry platform for Chinese guideline developers. And this year, we will open it to international guideline developers for free. There are many benefits that guideline registration include increased transparency, avoid bias and duplication, improve credibility, enhancing cooperation, and promoting dissemination and implementation. The other project is about guideline reporting standard. After consult and the PRISMA statement, collaborate with more than 10 countries and international organizations, we are developing right statement for practice guideline to improve transparency. So this is the official website of right and I warmly welcome health care researchers and uh, practitioners to join us to promote the improvement of the quality of the guideline together. Lastly, I'd like to introduce an old man, the founder of Cochrane Collaboration, Sir Ian Charms, who is now focusing on disseminate evidence-based knowledge and the methods to the public with his colleagues they published a great science popular book named Testing Treatments. Based on this book, they created a website named Testing Treatment Interactive. Uh, actually, this website can help not only professionals, but lay people further understand what is evidence-based medicine, what is clinical trial, and systematic reviews. It has already been in 10 languages, including Chinese. So if anyone would like to conduct a version of the other language, please do not hesitate to contact me or story in charms. In the end, I will close my presentation by a famous thing by Mew Gray. Knowledge is the enemy of disease. The application of what we know will have a bigger impact on health and disease than any single drug or technology likely to be introduced in the next decade. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chang. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Dr. An from Korea? Okay, so, okay. Uh, th uh, thank you, Dr. Chang. So, thank we you. will move to the next speaker and then uh, question again. So, uh, next speaker, Dr. Chen Jia-Fung is the president of Taiwan Evidence-Based Medicine Association and uh, director of the Division of Plastic Surgery, Taipei Medical University, Wangfang Hospital, Taiwan. He is also an associate professor at School of Medicine, Taipei Medical University, Taiwan. Uh, he has been one of the pioneers in the development of EBM in Taiwan. Dr. Chen, please go ahead. Yes, uh, I'm Dr. Chen from Taiwan. Uh, thank you for the in, uh, invitation from the conference. Uh, uh, I will introduce uh, uh, my story in the country that uh, uh, we, we uh, mobilize people for EBM implementation in Taiwan. Yeah, uh, Taiwan is a, a small island in the Far East. We can see that uh, the, it's a very far from the Europe, and the population is 23 million people in a, a 36,000 uh, kilometer. Uh, the, uh, one very important factor is that uh, uh, we don't speak uh, English in the population. Uh, usually the formal uh, language is uh, tra traditional Mandarin. So it's a key barrier to uh, implement the uh, evidence-based uh, medicine knowledge in the society. Um, the, 
the term evidence-based medicine uh, was introduced uh, uh, since 1992. It, uh, but the uh, first uh, attempt uh, from Taiwan to introduce uh, the knowledge into Taiwan is uh, uh, from a uh, grassroots. It's a, a local hospital, Zhanghua Christian Hospital. They send people to Oxford to uh, learn EBM. Uh, so uh, that's a time about uh, uh, 1996. And, uh, um, they, when they come back to Taiwan, uh, they have a several workshop and, uh, um, until 2001, the Northern Taiwan, uh, started to introduce, uh, the EBM, um, study from the uh, Wanfang Hospital, the hospital I'm working in. And, uh, I want to introduce, uh, the story, just follow the diffusion of innovation model, um, the Rogers, uh, Rogers say that uh, uh, there are five stages of uh, innovation in the uh, decision. Uh, so uh, in the story, the uh, innovation is state for the uh, evidence-based medicine knowledge. So in the first stage, uh, there are some key factors, just like uh, a recall of information and comprehension of message. So uh, in the in Taiwan, the far eastern area, the most important thing is to prepare the local language. Uh, uh, so we started to uh, translate a few um, textbooks, just like this textbook, and uh, the textbook for systematic review, and uh, some uh, textbook for uh, guideline writing. And then the, in the second stage, it's a persuasion stage. We have to make people like the uh, information. So, uh, again, we started from the translation. Uh, we have some research on the pe people's behavior. In Taiwan, usually physicians uh, can understand and use the English database uh, pretty good, but for other uh, uh, professionals, uh, they like the uh, Chinese database. So, uh, from 80 years ago, we started to translate the Chinese abstract uh, for the um, CDSR. We mobilized people instead of uh, delegate uh, it to the business company. We mobilized people, so totally there were uh, 800 uh, uh, people take part in the uh, translation work, and we built up a, a platform. So it, it's a process of education. And uh, uh, right now we have uh, another new idea. We uh, try to um, use uh, a crowdsourcing. Uh, we uh, talk to the uh, Cochrane Library, and uh, uh, we try to um, uh, we try to make it possible that uh, make the translator's main name uh, in the website in the official CDSR website, and uh, uh, in the persuasion stage. There are some features just like a discussion of a new behavior with others or acceptance of a message and a formation of a positive image of the message and the innovation. So, uh, so we need some uh, successful story to spread out in the uh, society and uh, uh, we need a support for the in innovation behavior from the system. So in the, uh, in, at this stage, we have a uh, some conference and a contest and uh, uh, to share the successful story. So we have a EBM contest. Uh, it, it's a driving force. Um, the, the rule of the EBM contest is that uh, there must uh, have a, a three different healthcare professional to join a team and uh, uh, they have two and five hours to prepare the uh, EBM. Uh, con uh, contents and uh, at last uh, um, all the teams you present. Uh, so that's a, a theme of the uh, EBM contest. And uh, in the past few years, we can found that uh, uh, every year there are uh, almost 100 teams to take part in the uh, national EBM contest. And uh, uh, e even each organization, they have their own EBM contest. And the uh, implementation, implementation uh, stage, 
the feature is the acquisition of additional information about innovation. So we need to uh, build up a website and uh, uh, we uh, try to uh, build up the um, uh, educational system in a PGY uh, university curriculum or nurses on um, job training system and even a continual uh, medical education. So uh, the it is now mandated for all medical graduate education in Taiwan and in continual medical education uh, uh, it's required for six to ten hours of EBM training course. And uh, uh, the CEBM in Taipei Medical University uh, it's a, a very important home base for the uh, mobilization of the uh, EBM in the society. And so uh, we uh, um, established the uh, Eastern Asian Cochrane Alliance in the uh, Taipei Medical University, and we have uh, uh, many tutor training workshop and an international uh, EBM training workshop, and uh, uh, create the EBM curriculum for the society. The it uh, composed of uh, nine topics for the basic EBM teaching and 14 topics for advanced EBM teaching. And if one uh, want to become a tra trainer, uh, they should, uh, he should fulfill the following condition, just like uh, the uh, four hours of basic course, eight hours of advanced course, for tutor training course, and a one hour teaching practice. So right now we have about 100 trainers in the uh, society. And uh, uh, the last is the confirmation stage, the feature uh, recognition of the benefit of using innovation and the integration of innovation into ongoing routine and promotion uh, in a large scale. So uh, in our society, we have a, a, C, a guideline development uh, to echo the uh, policy importance. Uh, so uh, there are many guidelines developed. Uh, even the legislation member requests uh, uh, some topics just like uh, hepatitis, uh, liver cirrhosis, hepatoma, and uh, osteoporosis. And uh, there are uh, many pressures from the social interest and the lobby group just like uh, osteoporosis, other uh, chronic kidney disease, or other nutrition guidelines. So uh, there are many guidelines developed. And uh, uh, even in the CDC, there are uh, adopt the uh, WHO standards in the guideline and uh, uh, we also uh, translate the guideline into English and uh, successfully uh, put it in the uh, National Guideline Clearing House and we will, uh, uh, right now uh, we are doing a, a nationwide project, it's a, a IDOH project and uh, uh, in this project we build up a, a, a website and make all uh, department, of, department of Health affiliated hospital can freely access Cochrane Library uh, since 2012. Uh, we are um, applying uh, new educational tools and uh, we have a multiple uh, EBM promotion just like uh, the a promotion poster award. Uh, uh, it's a kind of a contest uh, to develop a clinical scenario and a press EBM, and uh, that's an award. And uh, uh, it's a very interesting contest. Uh, the EBM detector contest uh, nationwide. Uh, the gold uh, award is uh, a mobile phone. Uh, and so in the past few years, we can found that uh, uh, the publication of a systematic review in Taiwan is increasing, especially after the uh, uh, Edwin Chang, he comes to Taiwan to have a several uh, teaching course on uh, the society. And uh, so that's a tool we have uh, passed in a few years. And in the future, uh, there are three uh, main topics that uh, we were uh, doing is that uh, uh, we want to uh, establish the Cochrane Taiwan and uh, two of uh, facilitate the international cooperation and to strengthen the Taiwan uh, EBM Association to improve the quality uh, improvement activity and uh, to uh, 
build up the school for EBM research uh, to foster the environment for educational and the research. Uh, so that's my talk. At a, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, th uh, thank you, Dr. Chan. Uh, uh, both uh, two speakers, so we have uh, some questions or comments uh, from flow and the remote speakers. Uh, first of all, I have uh, uh, one question to both of you. Uh, referring to choosing wisely movement, I am wondering whether there are any reluctance from medical doctors group in Taiwan or China, because in South Korea, uh, there are a little bit reluctance or against the atmosphere in doctor society. How how do you maintain arm's length relationship between choosing wisely group and the doctors group? This is my question. Uh, 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 okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, uh, uh, it's a. I share our experience here that uh, actually um, physician group. Uh, Sometimes it's they reluctant to the uh, the social mobilization, but however, there are several different kind of specialty, uh, just like uh, um, the the family practitioner or the orthopedics. Uh, they um, because of the uh, I personally am the uh, plastic surgeon, and uh, some of our uh, co member they are also uh, health professional. Uh, all the uh, physicians. So uh, we started from these uh, group, uh, so it, it, that will make things easier. And uh, one after another, and uh, uh, gradually uh, they will come to uh, seek help. Especially the uh, they when they want to develop the guideline, they will uh, seek the methodology help from the group. So that's our experience. Okay, oh, from China, any comment? On this uh -huh. From my view, uh, you know, in China, the clinicians, why they would like to do EBM research because they can publish uh, English papers. So that's one attraction, I think. Um, but uh, our strategy is focus on medical students because uh, they are, you know, very interested in EBM and, uh, you know, uh, uh, we asked them to involve in some EBM mm -hmm. research, and uh, after three or five years, when they become clinicians, they can uh, use evidence and uh, they can conduct higher quality research. Okay, thank, uh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, are there any comments? Dr. An uh, from Co uh, Korea University? Mm. Do you have some comment yeah, on uh, you? Uh, Please, sorry. Thank you for a uh, click and they are along. Yeah. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you for an introduction of the EBM activity in your country. And uh, I think it is, uh, uh, it will be good, be a good uh, suggestion to an another country. And uh, for Cliff, uh, I would like yeah. to ask that, uh, uh, how, uh, how many supports, uh, what is the support from the government? Uh, yeah, the, the, yeah, actually the government come uh, relatively late. Uh, we call it the grassroots at the beginning uh, from the mm. uh, local hospital and uh, mm. uh, local people. And then uh, the initial fund uh, from the government is very limited. It, it's mm. about uh, uh, three, uh, it, it's very limited. It's about uh, three, uh, uh, 30,000 U.S. dollars per year is in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. It's the beginning from uh, 10 years ago. You, you, you may see that the, the money is not enough, but uh, uh, gradually uh, we, uh, we we just follow the the innovate, diffusion of innovation model. The successful mm -hmm. successful story is very very important for to encourage the hus hospital or uh, local people or even the government to uh, invest more. So uh, we uh, we have a uh, so it, it's very important to to spread out the the media and to just follow the model. I think is very important. Okay, mm -hmm. and how uh, long? Uh, the China is a so uh, large country, and right. then how about the uh, uh, relation among the 
uh, each local region uh, by, by uh, I mean, the, how about the activity locally and centrally, and what's the relationship between the each each local local activity? <laughs> in Japan? Yeah. Right. It's a it's a it's a good question. Uh, uh, to be honest, uh, uh, there are more than three or five uh, parts. I mean, for example, uh, in Beijing, for Beijing EBM centers, uh, they just uh, they think they are in the capital, right? <laughs> And uh, they sometimes they just uh, hold uh, a conference and a workshop just in Beijing. But the Shanghai professors, uh, the professors and clinicians in Shanghai think they are the uh, most uh, you know development area. So, so but uh, in Chinese Cochrane Center, you know they are in Chengdu. So mm -hmm. from my perspective, uh, the cooperation is, is it's not very good so far. So I, I don't know the, the, the reason, but um, I, I hope in the future we can um, collaborate or cooperate, uh, you know, mm. so, um, more, more quickly and more efficiently so that mm. we can work together to uh, produce uh, good evidence and uh, translate, translate those evidence into practice. But now I'm not very satisfied. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, per personally, uh, I I can I would like to suggest that the EBM contest, uh, mm -hmm. since everyone can uh, take part in every good. kind of a contest. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a good try. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Okay, okay. So uh, now I'm closing the session. So special thanks to all speakers and the preparation staff for this uh, cyber communications. Okay, next APAN meeting will be held in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia in coming August. So I hope to see you online again and then. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, please, Goodbye. Uh, before thank closing, you. Cliff and the Long, please mm -hmm. take yeah? it on the line. So maybe... Yeah, okay, can... okay. No problem. Okay, and we will stay on the okay. line. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Young Song Yeah. Uh, I mean, that even though you catch up and you can Okay, I'm sorry. Here, we uh at, at this um, lunch on time, so. Okay. You, maybe you can we can move. leave uh, for lunch, and but uh, on the uh, cyber communication, we need to uh, talk more. Dr. An, would you. Okay, I excuse Go ahead. No problem. Okay. This is for my. Uh, the session is ended. And. Uh, uh, Cliff and Yaolong, uh, mm -hmm. for, yes? for the Jeju workshop, mm -hmm. yes? uh, how about the uh, uh, promotion is going in the, in the country? Yep, uh, I, I think, yeah, uh, uh, I think the, the uh, e-medium, the EDM is very important. Uh, we'll, we'll, if we uh, prepare the EDM, we can spread out the EDM uh, a lot of copy because we have the email list. So mm -hmm. we believe that the uh, EDM is the most uh, important strategy. So uh, at, at the least, uh, I, uh, st we, we started to uh, translate the website and I, I think the uh, website translation is very important for the promotion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, so anyway, the, you, you already sent to the uh the EDM electronic directory direct mail right yes EDM. yes the the, the e e EDM uh which means um we have some newsletters so the pro promotion electronic promotion material uh -huh. that we can spread uh -huh. out uh, uh, you made uh it. I yeah I will made it I I will um, I will mail it or uh because I have the a mail list a uh, mail list. I have a uh, more than twenty thousand mail list here, um, oh. and it's very effective and focus okay. focus the group. It's good. It's good. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you mm -hmm. you, you will translate anyway. The clip you your team will translate it, right? Yeah, we're starting to do it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, how long? Uh, how about you in your country? Okay. Yes. Uh, as you know.